Hey, it's Noel from Country Credits. I'm here with Seth Mosley, two-time Grammy award-winning national producer and with over 30 number one hits. So it's so great to have you, Seth. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, we're super excited to have you here. Um, obviously, your background is very heavy in the Christian music industry, but um, a lot recently in the country music industry as well. And I know that you recently signed with Sony Music Publishing of Nashville, so that's super exciting. Um, so I kind of just want to start the interview and go back to how you started. Um, if there's someone in particular who introduced you to country music or music in general and kind of like how you got to where you are today. Yeah. Um, so, yes, you're exactly right. I my my path into Nashville kind of started through the Christian music industry, which was sort of the world that I grew up in. It was what I was, uh, I was joke with people that I wasn't even allowed to listen to secular music in my house. Yeah, um, yeah. My parents have chilled out a, a, a good bit since then, but Christian music was just the only thing I knew existed. Yeah. <laughs> so I grew up at doing it. Um, I had a chance to work with a lot of the acts that I grew up listening to, which was really cool. So I ended up started, starting a company around my songwriting and production called Full Circle Music, just because it was all these full circle moments of working with the people that I grew up listening to. And um, and that led uh, into working. I got I got a chance to work with a band from Canada called High Valley. Yeah. And um, through that, got really plugged into the Canadian country scene and had a bunch of radio success up there. And then High Valley signed a deal down here with Warner Nashville. And we did a record with them. Um, had two singles that went top 10 and uh, so that just kind of opened up my eyes to like some of the other possibilities and mm -hmm. uh, to be honest like I just all have always admired the songwriting yeah. side of country music uh, it's just it really is the highest bar Nashville country songwriting is to me the highest bar of songwriting that there is anywhere in the world because there's no room for filler. It's all about the every word has to count. It has to be all about the idea. It can't just be a cool sounding track. Mm -hmm. And so um, I pressed pretty heavy into that world. And then, yeah, like you said, I, I had the chance to sign with uh, Sony Nashville, which really their flag is planted heavily in the country world. Yes. <laughs> and so they've, they've helped me develop a ton of relationships in that space. And we've gone on in the first year uh year and a half working with them already had cuts with gabby barrett uh, we got one coming out with blake shelton we have a new uh tim mcgraw cut which is track one on his new record coming out soon and then a ton of other really really exciting stuff in the works as well so i'm just thankful to be doing it uh, there's not a day that goes by that i'm not uh in just complete gratitude for having a job being able to show up and do this every day i know it's something that so many people move to nashville with the hopes and the dreams to do so any anytime i have a chance to give back and hope uh hopefully extend a hand to somebody who is out there trying to make it i always always take a chance to do that so thank you for doing this this show and for country credits because it's given a lot of really great info to people who are trying to figure out how the industry works. Yeah, no, there's so many people and that's kind of how I started it. People were saying like, I want to know more. And, and then I, oh, that person wrote this song. I didn't know. I thought the artist wrote that song or um, what's the production side like. And so I kind of just want to spotlight that whole end of it. It's so fascinating. And I think, like you said, so many people move to Nashville with a dream and the more people they know that they can get connected with and just learn from them is just going to be so important for their journey. Um, so I think we definitely should go into a lot of the things that you talked about already, um, Phil Circle Music and all of those cuts. Um, the Gabby Barrett cut, I feel like, was just so great for her career. I feel like that song is just so perfect for her time, but it's also so relatable. And I think that's why it's already doing so well. Um, so was there, when you, when you wrote for that song, was there like a moment where it just kind of all spilled out at once or was it? maybe harder than you would have thought and it just ended up perfect or like what's the story behind that song no honestly that that was one of the easier writing sessions that we've had in the last uh couple of years it, it, it was with anytime I'm I'm with my favorite co-writers I always know it's going to be at least like a fun day we're going to have a good time yeah. I don't know if we're going to come out with like a, a smash hit song but we're going to get something good that we're at least excited about and so that day I was booked with James McNair and Emily Wiseband, who are two of my most frequent collaborators. And we had Gabby on the right. She was on via Zoom. 
And um, yeah, I it was honestly one that I had prepared a lot for, like probably more so than any other session mm -hmm. up until that point. Just like I just I was a big fan of Gabby. Um, I wanted to have a bunch of ideas ready to play. Um, so I had I had like a complete verse chorus done wow. for a song that I played for James and Emily. Um, at the beginning, I'm like, yes, this is amazing. Let's let's do that if she wants to do it. And then she ended up kind of she when when she hopped on Zoom, we were just talking about like where where she at in life and just she's in a really sweet spot with her family. And I was just resonating a lot with that. And Emily got married not too long ago. James just had his first kid. And we're like, man, that, we need to do more of that kind of thing. So the idea that I had brought in, um, we we're like, let's put this in our back pocket. We'll literally let's write this song with Gabby and then we'll finish and finish this other thing because it's a it's a very different vibe, more more emotive and. Uh, it just wasn't where she was at. So um, I had this kind of Keith Urban-ish sound and track um, I played for. And she's like, I love that. Let's do that. And then I think at some point, Emily might have thrown out the title Glory Days. And um, that song wrote itself really fast. It was it was probably two hours start wow. to finish. And um, we had the demo done. It was honestly, the whole thing was like the quickest I've seen anything happen in the way Nashville stuff works. It usually takes forever. You write a song and then the average time that it, it it's written to like when the writer get, gets paid for it is like six years in the Sony Sony system. Yes. But this one was like, we wrote it in February and it was out like literally released and out on the radio like a few months later, which, which just never happens. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just super thankful to be part of it. It's a song I, I resonate with so much just on a personal level. And I'm glad that so many other people are as well. Yeah, I mean, I feel like even if, you know, whether you're married with kids or you're just in a happy point in your life, I just feel like it's such an easy song to relate to. And it's just uplifting. Like it's, there's no like reading behind the lines. It's kind of just, I'm happy to be where I am and just enjoy the moment. So I love that one. Um, and then with the Tim McGraw, obviously standing room only was a, a very big like moment recently in country music. And then we're all waiting for the album. So you have the number, you know, the number, the first track on the album, right? Yes. It's a song called Hold On To It. I wrote with uh, Jimmy Erie and uh, Ryan Larkins, who's another great new country artist and writer. And um, that one was How just... Much you say about it. <laughs> say it again. I don't know how much you could say about it at the moment, but... Yeah, I probably can't say too much about it because I'll I definitely want to make sure that he has the chance to unveil it how he wants to. But safe to say, we're just super excited that he recorded it. Um, it it's always a dream to have somebody who's on the level of Tim McGraw record one of your songs, and so I'm just I'm super excited for the world to hear it with his voice on it. Yeah, that's a very big deal. It's very exciting. Um... And all your other number one hits, obviously, they weren't all in the country music scene. But um, when you're writing a song, do you feel like there's typically a moment where you're like, I could see this being a number one? Or is it usually end up surprising that a song did so well when you thought maybe it was just, you know, a write that went well, but you weren't sure where it was heading? Like, how do how is your perspective on a song once it's finished and then seeing it go number one? Yeah, honestly, the process is exactly the same. <laughs> for a song that does nothing to a song that goes number one there's it, nobody really knows mm -hmm. I mean if if I knew and if anybody knew that's like the only way we would do things right but it, it really is more just about showing up and it's like it's you know Rusty Gaston who's our president of Sony Nashville is such a great champion for songwriters yes. <laughs> and he he always says it's not a numbers game but it is a numbers game mm -hmm. you just have to show up and the one the writer's and the producers who write the most are the ones who are going to have the most cuts and right. the ones who have the most cuts are going to have the most number ones. It just, it, it is, it, it does come down to being a numbers game. Right. So I don't really concern myself too much with anything other than at this point in my life, just showing up and just writing the best song I can. And then right. the next day doing the same thing. And then the next day doing the same thing. And I think if you get too caught up watching radio charts and stuff, I just, I've been there and it it's not a fun like I'd rather just it be a surprise when something does really well and and uh and just focus on the actual creating of it because that's to me that's the fun part anyway. 
Yeah, definitely. I could totally see that. Um, that kind of led into like one of my next questions was basically just um, now that obviously you're with Sony, what's like your average day like? Like, do you have a set number of rights per week? And then on the production side, like, how does it even out? Does it kind of like equal out time spent writing and producing, or is it more so just writing now? Yeah, it probably breaks down to something like um, three to four rights a week. I have a day blocked off every week that I kind of use just to start ideas, start song ideas, start tracks, write titles down, just kind of, mm -hmm. it's kind of white space. Brainstorming, so yeah. I, yeah, so I've been doing that once a week. And then production is kind of like, um, it's kind of like the mortar that's in between all those other bricks. It's it's sort of like, like even before this, like we had like an hour production session with the a band to sign off on some mixes so it's kind of like it's not like we're there are days that we do full band tracking in the studio but a lot of it is just sprinkled in between sessions and things so it's it's a very full week there i i don't have any downtime as far as like down to the minute if you look at my schedule like it's it's down to the minute because the second i'm at work i'm, I'm there to work and then the second i'm off work i'm heading home to be with my family so it's like i just want to max max out and just not not waste any time exactly and like networking obviously is a huge part of this industry and just knowing people and jumping in rights that you maybe didn't expect to jump into because you know someone um so for like aspiring songwriters and people that might just have moved to nashville what how i guess what's the biggest piece of advice you would give them on jumping in and then playing on that networking and just who you know like how important is that aspect to you personally yeah, I honestly, it's 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 an area that I'm not great at. Um, I wish I was better at it of just going out and hanging out and schmoozing and doing the whole. But honestly, that's that's always been my weak weak point. Um, and so that's where I, I am really thankful to have somebody like Sony on board, who's, um, you know, they they know who's who's hot and who's up and coming, and who they, they've put me with so many people that I've never heard of that ended up being really really awesome uh you know, successful artists but uh what i would say is like starting out it really is less about going out and and trying to like get in with the a-list people than it is just sort of building a camp with other like-minded people who are at a similar level to where you're at right. and so so that can happen in a lot of ways it can happen by showing up at writers rounds a lot of it happens online nowadays just with things like tiktok and uh, you know, DMs on Instagram. I mean, that's a very, very valid way to network and connect with people. But I, I, the thing that I always say, and we, we talk about this in our Song Chasers group, we had an entire month all about networking uh, two months ago. And the big takeaway, or one of the big takeaways was just, you know, you can't, um, you can't go into a situation expecting, uh, well, let, let me say it like this. You should go into a situation looking at what can I give and how can I add value to this situation or to this person rather than like, what can they do for me? Mm -hmm. I think people, when uh, when you approach them and they sense that, like it's it, it just put, they, they put up a wall and it doesn't, it, it's, it's not a good way to build relationships. So you kind of have to treat every relationship for what it is, not like a transaction, but treat a relationship like a relationship. Like, is this a person who, if music was not even like, in the on the table like would i just enjoy hanging out with this person would i enjoy doing life with this person because that's for me what i what i see over and over again with the the, the successes i've had and the, and the successes my friends have had it's just those those types of things where you're going to just have a lot of time with a person because you may end up writing 20 30 40 50 songs to get to the one that actually does something but to get to that 20 30 40 50 you got to be like a, a great person to hang with and like be somebody that somebody wants to have around all the time and so it's it's really less of like how do you network and it's more just like basic relational skills right and you know if you're at chapter five um being realistic about where you're at like I, you're probably not gonna have a great shot networking with somebody who's at chapter 30 like right you got to network and build a camp with people who are at your level and then at, and you, you'll, you'll, you'll come up together. You'll grow together. That's, that's usually how it always works. And I feel like the Nashville scene is just so 
it's so perfect for that. It's a, you know, it's a big city, but it's also small enough that a lot of people know each other and it's easy to run into people. Um, there's so many places for writers rounds and just ways to get plugged in throughout, you know, town. So I think it's the perfect place for people to just go and just jump in. And um, listening to people's stories is always something that is inspiring. You can learn from like anyone, anyone around town. Um, for sure. So yeah, I mean, obviously you started Full Circle Music. When did you start Full Circle Music? And did you solely start it with the intention to help up and coming writers and producers? and Or did it kind of just turn into that slowly from more educational side? Like, How did it all happen? Yeah, I, I guess what I would say with that is, is I sort of fell, uh, fell into the place that I'm at now, which is, you know, my big focus today is still as, as me as a songwriter and a, and a music producer, and I have a co-producer that I do a lot of stuff with. Um, and then the company side of things really is about the academy. So it, it is the giving back piece. It's the teaching, it's the education, it's bringing up the next generation of songwriters and producers. And when I started Full Circle, it was back in, I think, 2017, because I was getting to this point where I was having a lot of success as a producer, as a writer, having the number ones, the Grammys and stuff. But I wanted to, I was thinking a little bit beyond like, okay, well, if it's just about me and it's just a me show, like it just doesn't seem that fun. Like I want, I want to be having a team around me and having people to celebrate this stuff with and like um, bringing other people along. Like it just, it just never seemed like uh, a, a natural thing to do it any other way. So um, I know, and, and it's also, you know, there's some strategic thinking to it of like, yeah, I, I want something that I build to outlast me when I'm gone to where, you know, maybe it's something my kids can help be a part of someday or mm -hmm. something that really makes a lasting impact in the industry and does a lot of good. And so, um, you know, starting a company uh, can, can be really one of the great ways to do that. And, and so Full Circle Music started as um, a, a publishing company. We had a, 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 a little label services side of things that we had with Cobalt Music, and then we had our academy in addition to our production and writing. Right. And so we ran the publishing and label side for about four or five years. I had an amazing, uh, amazing friend named Stacy Wilbur that ran that, did an incredible job. We signed six or seven writers during that time, learned a ton, had some, some good success on that side. But in the process of doing that, um, a, a couple of years ago, I, I made the decision really just to scale back the amount of things that I'm involved in, just to really focus on less. And so the the the, the pieces that I that I chose to cut out in that season were the publishing and the label. Um, it may come back at in some way, shape, or form in the future, but uh, right now, anything that's outside of my own writing endeavors or production endeavors is is the academy it's dedicated to giving back teaching um song chasers is our is our community that we have for aspiring writers and, and, and artists and musicians and i just have such a great time getting to teach and bring in my bring in other industry friends to teach uh so it's just it's, it's, it's a great balance. <laughs> yeah it's a great balance for me right now that's great yeah so on average like how many people that like, do they have to sign up for it or is it kind of like you can jump in last minute like how does that work for people that may be interested yeah so song chasers is an ongoing thing um it's it's a monthly membership that people uh you know we we, we basically talk about it in the sense of like you can go to belmont you can go to berkeley mm -hmm. but honestly the degree in music and songwriting it's not going to do anything for you and you're going to learn way more learning from people who are actually doing the thing today and not exactly. that did it 10 years ago. And we, we, we have, you know, right now out in the other room, we have four Belmont interns and we love, we have great relationships with the folks at Belmont, but at the same time, man, is it really the best path to go? If you want to become a writer or a producer or an artist to go, you know, 200 grand into debt, mm -hmm. probably not. And so that's where we were like, there's gotta be a better way to do this. And uh, we we did courses for a while. We still have some courses available in songwriting and music production. But the thing that we felt like would be more beneficial was an ongoing, um, you know, it includes all the training that you get in a course, but it's also just the community of, of people that you can collaborate with, ask questions of, get accountability and celebrate wins together and grow together. And so that's what 
has turned into song chasers and and so yeah that's our that's our uh our, our monthly um membership for songwriters that is so cool I think, I, I mean, I agree with you 100%. I think if you're a songwriter, you're going to be a songwriter, whether someone's teaching you things or whether they're not teaching you things, it's just kind of flowing from you. Um, but all education is obviously worth something. So that's really, really exciting. Um, and I will definitely throw a link in for that. But um, yeah, I mean, what, so was there one person in your life that gave you a piece of advice that always stuck with you? Um, and if it wasn't one piece, was there just one person that really, really, I guess made such an impact in how you're doing life now versus if they weren't in your life, it would be very different. <laughs> Man. So, so many, um, I sure, can't, it, it's going to be very hard for me to pick one. <laughs> um, just some that stand out. I, I, uh, I've had a blast doing the made it in music podcast over the last several years. That was sort of how I got into the Academy side of things. And, um, Shane McAnally, I learned so much just from talking to him in the process and I learned, you know, it's, 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 it's nobody's an overnight success, which I always knew, mm -hmm. but I just didn't realize like how long it took even for him to like live in Nashville for seven years, move to LA for seven years, move back to Nashville. Like it was like 14 years before he got anything going. Yeah, and that so, is crazy. It's, it's crazy. So, but, but I guess the thing was, was it was, it was number one, I guess a dose of reality, but, but also just to say that like, I mean, the people who are at the top are are there because they have just stayed at it longer than anybody else was willing to. Right. And um, so that was a big one. Uh, Tom Douglas was one of my first interviews on that podcast, on the Made It Music podcast. And he, he said he had a similar story, too, where he, he moved to Nashville, tried to make it, moved back to Texas, quit for a while, became a commercial real estate agent, moved back to Nashville, finally got his first song cut by the time but he wasn't like 40 years old until that happened mm -hmm. right and so there's just so much of that but um people in my life you know i the the first producer that brought me to nashville was a guy named ian Escalin, who was primarily in the christian world mm -hmm. and um i just honestly it was like a boot camp just learning like i didn't even know co-writing was a thing i didn't really know what the publishing and label thing was all about so he kind of schooled me in all of that I learned how to produce records the right way <laughs> you know um, from him rather than just uh doing what I thought was cool which again when you zoom out there really is no right way but I I learned a lot of tricks from just watching him um and then I, I'll share one one last one would be Reed Shippen was who's been a mentor of mine uh over the years and he's a, a Grammy winning mix engineer and producer and engineer and tracking engineer. He's just such a talented dude. Um, but I worked with him on a record back in 2009 and the artist came in, the manager came in. I thought it sounded cool. The artist and the manager were not feeling it. And they were like, we, we need to start this thing from scratch. And so I was just sitting in the corner waiting for like a fight to break out. I was like, this guy has like Grammys. Like, are you going to tell him that that's not right? Right. And and he he just scrapped. He was willing to scrap everything, start over. And um, I stayed with him after the session. And I was like, is that normal for you? Like, is that like part of the process? And he was just like, man, it's it's a service industry. It's a service business. Like what we do as songwriters and as producers, especially is we're serving the vision of the artist. That's the only thing we're doing. Yeah. And so I've taken that with me every day like every record i get to work on i always have that in the back of my head that yeah i've got i've got creative ideas and it is a creative job but it's it's ultimately serving the vision of the artist and, and those are the producers and the writers who stay around in this town is the ones who have that mentality right yeah that's definitely something wow um and then with uh recently with streets of gold um you were doing production and writing on that right so was that like planned out or was that something that sony helped you and then you got into the production side like how did that come about i know they're more up and coming but um it was still a great song yeah no i'm glad I, thank you for shouting that one out that was that's an awesome song we actually just had those guys in this morning finishing the next batch of stuff awesome. yeah I, love um, I think they're they're really great <laughs> they're great yeah so yeah that was so anything they set that up my production and writing has always been very linked but i'm also not like everything has to be me producing and writing everything like there are records that i just straight straight up produce and i don't write on 
And then there are records that I just write on that I don't produce. So right. it's, it's, there's no hard and fast rule. It's just like, I'll try to do a really good job on the demos. And if the artist likes where the demo is heading and it's like, okay, well, this would not make any sense to just start all over again. Usually they'll just have me hire me to finish it out. And so that's, that, that's been the case with, uh, yeah, with Tootin Brothers and with a lot of others as well too. And yeah, Streets of Gold was the latest one that we did. That was good. Did that, was that another one that just kind of like flowed when you started writing or? Yeah, it was on that. That was a pretty easy write. It was me and the, and the brothers and and uh, was, uh Kyle Sturrock as well too. He's a phenomenal writer. He's great. And it just yeah, it, it happened really quick. I, I don't I don't know some. I think sometimes that does happen where it's like you can get to greatness by like just slaving and crafting and chipping away. But I, but I, I I in my experience, it's 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 almost like cooler when you're not striving after it and it just sort of falls out and you just sort of grab this idea that if we didn't grab it this day somebody else probably would have yeah. and uh i just it's one of my favorite songs that i've been able to be a part of yeah yeah no i was a great hit um and obviously recent so i'm sure it'll be doing very well with streaming um but yeah i mean obviously it's not all easy and easy rights like that um was there like one song or one moment that you felt like the right just kept going on and you weren't getting there, but you had to get there for a certain artist or something. Um, I guess like, what are some of the struggles of being a writer in town and obviously producer as well? Yeah, I, I've had plenty of those too. And like I said, I mean, you, you really can't say that one way of doing it is right or wrong. Cause I've had equal success in the rights that have drug on for years and the ones that have taken two hours. So I, I wish there was like a, a magic formula for it but there just isn't you just have to chase it until it's right mm -hmm. um and the very first song that i had that went number one was with a band called newsboys it was a song called born again mm -hmm. and we probably worked on that song for like a year wow oh my gosh so it's it's not that we're working on it every day for for a year yeah. but like yeah. coming back to it you know taking a month off from it coming back to it seven 10 12 15 20 iterations later it is what it is um but it was in that process that i also learned the value of sticking with it and not giving up on it there, there's a uh there's a great brian eno quote uh, which i only discovered recently uh where he talks about um work making the viva la vida record with coldplay is one of my all-time favorite bands mm -hmm. and he said if something is good you must torture it mercilessly until it's either dead or great wow <laughs> pretty pretty accurate for you so it's it's it can be a good way to to, to look at the the creative and the production process and and um, i would say that's that's the fun part but it's also the hard part there are days that you just feel like throwing in the towel and mm -hmm. but you just can't you just have to focus just taking taking it a day at a time and you know, I don't know what today's going to bring. I don't know. I don't have control most of the time on whether it's going to be a uh, a hit or uh, just a total waste of time, you know, but but I never look at anything as a waste of time because it's, you got to write the next song to get to the next one, to the next one. It's just, it's it, oh, yeah. every, every step is essential. Literally. And then there's so many songs out there that just, I feel have the potential to go number one or at least chart the you know, somehow, and they just never, unfortunately, get heard to the right ears. So it's all about continuation and just, you know, not stopping. I mean, obviously, like you said, TikTok, Instagram, social media plays a big role in that, um, getting it out there before you're signed, and all of that. So that's very important. Yeah, it's it's hard. But it, but but I also want to say on the other coin is like, anybody can do this. Like, it's not it's not that the people, like I mentioned, like, you know, well, I'll just even take me like I, I don't have any formal training in music at all. Like I can't read music. I can't, um, you know, I'm I'm, an, I'm a decent instrumentalist, but I'm not like half as good as a lot of the players here in town. I'm not an amazing singer. Um, and a lot of a lot of my friends who are really successful, you could you could pretty much say the same things. You don't you don't have to be this freak, crazy talent with tons of resources and born into this family of relationships Love that. Yeah. you really don't have to have any of that you just have to have a desire and a passion to do it so if you really want to do it then do it like don't don't let the the hard 
side of it scare you away from it because it's still so worth it to me like the fact of when you celebrate uh you know or, or just go live and hear an artist singing one of your songs whether it's in a stadium or whether it's at you know the bluebird cafe like it's such it's the same feeling it's such a great thing to hear. literally that was my next question like hearing a number one live is it like oh my gosh, I wish I was up there like singing it with them. Or is it just as cool to just be in the back and be like, I remember that right. Like it must be so exhilarating, but it also must be like, wow, I remember it so clearly when we wrote that, like, and now all these people are singing it. It's crazy. It, it is crazy. I, I love being in the crowd where nobody, nobody has any idea who I am and that I had anything to do with it. So um, it's just, for me, the joy is like seeing other people resonate and be impacted and, and it just really become a part of their soundtrack for their lives so what's your um what's your favorite like right to date I mean it doesn't have to be country it could be one of your Christian ones but what's your favorite right and what's your favorite like song that you've done man again I'm gonna have a really hard time picking <laughs> <laughs> it's always the latest one that I did <laughs> and just, it's going to be the one that I did yesterday. Like, that's just, that's always going to be the case. Right. Um, and in fact, yeah, I, I would say uh, we had Cole Swindell in on Monday and wrote a great one with him and Emily and James. Uh -huh. uh, so I'm just going to say that because it's the most <laughs> top of mind. It's the most fresh. It, it's, you know, I don't know if it'll be a number one song, but I love it. Our team loves it. Cole loves it. It's it's just and yeah I can't can't wait to get get in and do it again I know that's a very uh, non answered probably to your question or not very well thought out answer to your question but that's what I'm gonna go with all right that's awesome um, and I pretty much just want to wrap up every interview the same way with this three simple questions not totally related to music but what's well somewhat related to music but three questions what's your favorite place to hang out in Nashville anywhere. Favorite all-time artist and then favorite up-and-coming artist. Favorite Nashville hangout. Um, I'm just going to go with, because it's where we always, me and my wife always go here pretty much every date night is Bar Taco. Nice. Um, it, it's not the most like fancy oh, no, it's place, great. but it's like, it's, we just love it. I, I love their, love their tacos and yes. they have really good margaritas. Um. I love, okay, the other question was favorite all-time artist. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'll go with Coldplay. I'll go with Coldplay. I've, I've seen them. I saw them live last year and just the, the hit after hit after hit and just how innovative they are, the live show, but how simple they are at the same time. It's nothing like crazy flashy parts or anything. Exactly. So, uh, and then favorite, um, what was the third question? Favorite up and coming artist. Favorite up and coming artist. Okay. It could be uh, like no one knows them yet. It could be anyone. I'm going to go with Jordana Bryant. Okay. I've been working with her since she was 14. She just, uh, she's turning 18 mm -hmm. here next week, actually. And so I'm just super proud of her. Like she's so young. She's still so young, but, but she's an old soul and just how she's grown in her writing craft and uh, grown in the, the work ethic of it too. Just like, she does the hard work that so many artists aren't willing to do on social media and, and, and like the networking stuff, like you were talking about, she just does so good and all that. So I'll, I'll go with Jordana Bryant. She's, she's got big things ahead. She's a phenomenal writer, phenomenal person, amazing singer, great performer, um, kind of the whole package. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for jumping on here and um, can't wait to see the Cole hit and the Blake hit and everything else, Tim McGraw. So yeah. Anything else? Less words, piece of advice. Yeah. yeah, I would say just, you know, a big part of my heart is obviously I love getting to do this every day. But um, if anybody out there who is questioning, like, is this something that I could do? Is this something that I could get into? I would say if you have even an, a, a, an inkling of an idea of a, of, a, of a spark of passion for it, then then chase after it. Like, it, once again, there's no formula. There's no prerequisites. Uh, just because someone is amazing at piano or has some classical training does not mean that they're going to be any more likely to make it than you are. So if you have a story to share, share it, put it out there. Don't, don't let it sit inside of you. You may not even be in a creative community or creative family where anyone else around you is encouraging you. And that can be really hard. Like if you're listening to this and you're from a small town in 
North Dakota and and you don't have a, a creative writing community, find one. And, um, you know, through things like country credits, like listen to all these interviews, um, you know, check check out the stuff that we're doing with Song Chasers. Check out our podcast, Made It Music podcast. We have a lot of really good YouTube content as well um, on our Full Circle Music YouTube channel, too. So um, I'd love to to be a part of your story, just in, 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 a, in a level of encouraging you and um, hopefully helping uh, hopefully helping you ultimately avoid some a lot of the mistakes that I made along the way. So we'd definitely love to hear from you guys. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs>